Welcome to Accept Your Gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life. My name is Tracy Crow. I'm an author, writing coach, and Marine Corps veteran. I'm looking forward to co-creating today's show with you. So if you're ready, are you ready? I'm ready. So if you're ready to live a more creative, more magical life, let's get started. Here we are, already week three of Accept Your Gifts. Before I introduce today's special guest, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for listening to our first five episodes and for co-creating this experience with me, with all of us. Every time one of you leaves a comment about your personal takeaway from an episode, you're helping to co-create a deeper resonance perhaps a broader understanding for each one of us. With every comment, you're providing another breath of life, if you will, to that episode. This reminds me of the multidimensional reading experience that we gained from poetry. Have you read a poem lately? Uh, I think I just heard someone shout, not since eighth grade in that Robert Frost poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. (laughs) By the way, I love that poem. Anyway, here's what I mean about the multidimensional quality a poem offers us. You see, when we read a poem, we're reading it three ways and almost simultaneously. The whole process is really magical in a way because of a poem's use of concrete imagery combined with tone, often lyrical, and metaphor. We're not just reading the obvious lines of a poem on the pages. We're also reading between the lines for meaning, and we're reading beyond the lines because an artfully crafted poem holds a note of resonance that lives beyond the meaning of its final line, if only for one more breath of, ah, connection, meaning. So by sharing your takeaways from each of our episodes, you are providing another breath, another, ah, Another connection that extends far beyond the broadcast. So, we're co-creating a little magic, aren't we? Are you having fun yet? I sure hope so, because I am. Some of your takeaways are reaching me through private channels, and that's fine too. Such as this one, after episode 5 that featured Renee Neal, the breakout visual artist who overcame incredible trauma after the remembrance of her grandmother's childhood advice, the grandmother who said, what you tell yourself you are, you are. And this remembrance compelled Renee to start journaling and to pick up, of all things, a box of crayons. Renee hasn't stopped coloring and painting a pathway back toward the remembrance of who she is and of who she truly came here to be. The back channel message from the listener was this. What is so great about all this is how much it is expanding my world. Renee is real, honest. From the first sound of her voice, she had me. I live for that truth and honesty. Ah, yes. Remember episode four, during which I shared the story of a New Year's Day blindfold challenge and about how an understanding of metaphor deepens our everyday life experiences? A listener left this comment, I feel like I'm finding another little piece of myself that I didn't know was there with every episode. (sighs) Let me say, you're not the only one, dear listener. I'm discovering the same thing about myself, and I can hear Patricia Hampel's resurfacing from our launch episode about the value of storytelling. Remember, you give me your story, I get mine. You give me your story, I get mine. Wow. I believe each of these episodes is encouraging us to reconnect with forgotten pieces of ourselves. Perhaps we're gaining a remembrance of who we truly are, you know, before all the scripts took over about who we should be. In some ways, it even feels as if we're lifting a veil on all the shoulds and all the must-dos of everyday life 
and discovering things like wonder and joy on the other side of that veil. Hopefully, we're now all gifting ourselves more these days with activities that are weaving new patterns for living our lives with more peace, more love, more joy, and more purpose. And that's my segue for today's episode. Today, my special guest is Carly Fairchild. Carly lives her life as a journey, living each adventure to the fullest. She has studied survival skills since she was a teenager. And for the last several years, Carly has been studying an earth-based philosophy of healing that's supported by the premise that our feelings and emotions are meaningful communications and that if ignored or suppressed, could cause disharmony within us, and in some cases, even physical ailments. Carly's other passions include basket weaving, shelter building, fire making, and the harvest of edible and medicinal plants. (laughs) Wherever Carly goes, she establishes a deep, meaningful connection to the land around her, and never was this connection more obvious or more admired than in 2016, when TV fans tuned in to watch, cheer, and learn from Carly's solo survival of 86 days as part of the History Channel survival series, Alone. But these days, Carly's traveling the country, teaching basketry and survival skills, giving inspirational presentations, and serving as an ambassador for L.T. Wright Handicrafted Knives, one of the few items Carly was permitted to take with her for that alone survival series. I first met this extraordinary young woman a few months ago when she visited our town and shared a few life lessons about living alone in the wild for 86 days. And I took her basketry class, my first ever attempt at basketry, and discovered quickly that there's so much more going on during the creation of a basket than I had ever dared to imagine. But I'll let Carly explain all that. Hey, Carly, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Tracy. All right, listen, I am just going to jump right in here. I'm going to tell you a confession that in prep for our discussion today, I read that during ancient Mesopotamia, baskets were considered the children of the gods and the basis of the earth because of their interwoven connections with earthen materials and utilitarian purpose. Will you share with us how you first became drawn to this ancient and now creative outlet? Yes, I'd be happy to. You know, I, I had baskets all around me growing up. Uh, my mom was a fan of Logan, Longenberger baskets, and so she collected those. Um, and then when I was a teenager, I went to a summer camp and learned how to make my first basket. And that was a woven basket to hold my water bottle so I could always have it with me at summer camp and stay hydrated. And I love the utilitarian use of making a basket and being able to use it. Oh, that is fascinating. So we sometimes, you know, have this negative connotation about basket and the weaving. And this is way before your time, young lady. But somehow it became like this joke that, basket weaving, a a college degree in basket weaving, or, oh yes, he graduated with a degree in basket weaving, and and it seemed to have taken on this negative connotation. What would you say about that? Yeah, you know, even in my generation, there's the joke about underwater basket weaving uh, degree (laughs) at college. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You know, have to get stepped up a a step, I guess. Um, But basketry is more than just a craft. Um, It is a skill that allows you to make a container for anything. You can make a tiny container um, or you can make a great big pack basket. And there's, uh, it takes a lot of time and skill to make a basket. Well, what do you see as the benefit besides um, having an end product? What do you see as the benefit from all that time? Yeah, a benefit is the connection that's formed with yourself and with the materials as you are making the basket. Can you explain a little bit about that? What do you mean about 
um, the connection. Yeah, the connection. You know, when I harvest natural materials, I'm going out to the plants and I'm I'm looking to see what plants um, are available for my use. But then also, how can I harvest the materials in such a way that the the rest of the plants that are that are in that area can become healthier? So I'm building a connection with the land and the plants, and then with myself as I'm present in my own body while harvesting one step of the process, and then in the actual formation of the basket you have to be present with the materials and like co-create with the materials the basket you're wanting to make ah that's one of my favorite words or this co-creation right so when you are in that present moment what does that feel like to you what is the value of that for you in that co-creating with the materials Hmm. the feeling is of of spaciousness and acceptance and like whole whole beingness um, as I'm working with the materials. Ah, oh, boy, that's beautiful. I love that. Do you have favorite materials that you like to harvest or that you like to use? Yes, my favorite material is uh, cedar bark. Um, it's hard. It's the inner bark of the cedar tree, both western red cedar, yellow cedar, white cedar can be used. Um, and that's my favorite material. Ah, oh, okay. Now, for those of us who do not have this connection or knowledge to the earth the way that you do, young lady, we would end up going to a store to buy materials, right? So what type of materials would you be recommending the beginner look for? Yeah, for a beginner basket, um, there's cane out there that you can buy at craft stores and make multiple dozens, hundreds of different kinds of baskets just out of cane, which is a material that's, uh, it's a natural material, but it is commercially harvested and processed for use. Um, You can also use yarns and uh, cotton twine or hemp to make coiled or soft fiber baskets. Well, I had the joy of sitting in on one of your classes when you came down here locally. And so I want to ask you this. As a teacher of basketry, what have you noticed about your students in these classes? And feel free, you can, you can use our class. <laughs> we won't not, not to name any names, but sometimes <laughs> uh, someone might show up and really have a negative connotation around crafting and say they're not a crafter and they can't do it. And what I would say to that person is basketry is not crafting. You know, Mm -hmm. it's an art form, it's a creation. Um, And it's it's different than just crafting. Um, And so when when I work with students, I notice how people approach it differently. Some people approach it with a lot of excitement, some people nervousness um and it can show myself and also people if they're willing to look how they interact with new materials and they can use that to see how they interact with things in their life do they get really frustrated do they are they willing to accept help or are they willing to ask for help um can all be shown through the medium of making a basket oh yes Definitely. I think our as class, we know. <laughs> as I know. Yes. I think we ran through the whole gamut of things <laughs> of all of that. Yeah, you're right. I, you know, I hadn't really thought about that, but how we show up for that class and what kind of attitude that we adopt in that class, what we bring to that class is probably kind of indicative for how we approach most of life's newest experiences, right? Yeah, I think so. Wow, that's really eye-opening. I like that. Okay, now I'm going to throw this one at you. What have you learned about yourself as a teacher of basketry? Yeah, you know, every class I learn something new. Um, but a theme that's been running recently is my, what is my capacity as a teacher? You know, and mm. what is the quality of teaching that I want to give? Um, you know, and that could be as simple as like, limiting the number of students I allow in my class so that I can give the quality of instruction that I really value um, when I teach. 
And so I'm, I'm learning more of how many people that is depending on the basket style that I'm teaching. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. What, um, what would you say that you took from basketry that helped you so much through that survival reality series alone in season three? Yeah, I took so much from basketry. Um, the shelter I built was essentially a basket. I wove the walls of my shelter um, using techniques that I know in basketry. Wow. And then I made baskets as I needed them. You know, I was, I was harvesting wild edible plants and I needed something to put those plants in when I harvested. And I didn't want to continue to use my hat all the time. You know, it was getting colder and I wanted that hat on my head. And so I wove a basket to harvest plants in. And, and the, the basketry helped me in many ways because it helped me you know, I, I had to live in the moment being out there, but I also had to plan for the future, which was unknown. I didn't know how long I would be out there. Right. And so harvesting materials to make baskets in the future was like an investment in me staying out there long enough to be able to need to make baskets. Mm. You were only allowed to take, what, four or five items out there with you? I was allowed to take 10 items with yeah. me. Okay. Yeah. And, and they weren't baskets, right? No, baskets were not on the list. (laughs) (laughs) So you're right. You really did have to make your own and use those for basic survival needs as well. Yeah. Yeah, And for my living needs, you know, it wasn't just survival. I was living out there and containers are part, are things we use in our everyday lives. Tell us a little bit about your opportunities with tracking school. And where does basketry fit in with what you've learned in the classes that you've taken to become a professional tracker? Um, I have, you know, I've kind of gone in two different tracks of schools. I've gone through the tracker school and learned tracking and survival skills. And then I've gone through wilderness fusion to be a healer. And basketry really, um, you know, Wilderness Fusion, it really applies to that in terms of the container of one's being and what is that woven out of? Ooh. You know, who, who am I and what is, you know, what are the spokes, which are the support parts of a basket? What are those in myself that are supporting me at all times? You know, and what is the pattern that I'm creating by these wefts that I weave in and out and the pattern can change over time? Um, you know, for, for listeners who haven't thought about their being, their container in that way, could you give a couple of examples of what those spokes might be? You know, I, it's questions that I, I'm continuing to ask of myself and um, some that I am choosing to have in my life right now for my spokes are to have peace, love, joy, and purpose in my life. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, the pattern of what is woven around those might shift and look, you know, different ways. It might look like me teaching a class. It might look like me helping my dad remodel his house. I have some construction background. So that's, you know, a pattern that I can weave in when I want to. Um, It might look like me teaching a summer camp. It might look like me giving a, um, doing a speaking engagement someplace, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at what pattern I want to create in my life around those core values that are most important to me. When you're going through the, um, the healing portion of the classes you're taking and you've made this, um, you've recognized how basketry is showing itself with those spokes and what we're weaving in as patterns. What are you noticing from some of those who actually come for the, the overall benefit of being healed from something? Are there any universal themes that you're noticing? You know, maybe somebody has a a specific uh, challenge in their life. And if I were to look at that, like a basket, that might mean like, a spoke is sticking out sideways, you know, and it's no longer w- woven in. Right. And so in a basket, what I would do is, is follow that and figure out where did it come out of the pattern? 
um, and then how, how can it be integrated back in? And so in a healing, when I'm working on a client, it's where, where does this challenge tie into the rest of their lives and how is it affecting all the areas of their life and which, which areas do they want to work on in that moment? Um, and what, what does it look like for them to have it woven back in, mm. you know, and that that's going to be different for each person. Right. Wow. I imagine you are witness to a great number of aha moments for, <laughs> for clients, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, for listeners, we're referring to energy healing, aren't we? Yes, roughly. Um, Although in a way the healing work that I do is more like multifaceted and isn't just energy um, because it's looking at the, the physical body, the energy body, the spiritual body, the emotional body, and the connection that one person has on all of those layers with other people in their lives on all of those layers and their connection with the earth. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's not just a two-dimensional thing that sometimes people think of when they hear energy healing. Okay. Thank not you. that all energy healing is, you know, two-dimensional. I'm sure there's, there's other people that do it in a, a broader sense as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, that's very helpful to explain that and clarify that for, for all of us, especially for me. So thank you. What, what, what advice would you offer listeners who think maybe I should give this basketry thing a try? What would you encourage them to do? Yeah. If you're excited about basketry, I would really encourage you to find other people that are also excited about basketry. And if you can find a class nearby um, to get a little instruction so that maybe some of those initial frustrations you might have can be supported and worked through. Um, And yeah, find something locally if you can to, to get yourself into it. And then just experiment with whatever materials you might have in your yard, in the park. Um, There's so many materials that you can work with out there that it's really your imagination is the limit. Mm, That's very helpful. And I guess we should also say, be aware that what you bring to class in the way of attitude, right? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> that how you show up to class will affect your 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 experience of the class as in all things in life if you show up with a bad attitude you're probably going to have a bad attitude about your experience if you show up with a an excited attitude you're probably going to be excited about your experience and all the all the ways that can look Yeah, so true, Carly. Carly, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing what you've learned about basketry and and just really how it connects with who we are and what we are capable of co-creating in our own personal experience. What a beautiful metaphor. You know I love metaphors. I am all about a metaphor. (laughs) Thank you so much, Carly. Thank you, Tracy. It was a a pleasure to be here. Ah, It's a pleasure to see you. I get to see you today. All right. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's co-creative listening experience. Please remember to leave a comment about the single greatest takeaway for you today. You know, that one thing you will remember from this day forward. Was it something funny or provocative? Was it just what you needed to hear? Please share so we can all benefit. And remember to return Tuesdays and Thursdays to Accept Your Gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life.